Okay, we're back. We're live. It's Wednesday morning. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. And uh, the lady with me is uh, Helen Turner. She's vice president of Shamanad. And she joins us, of course, by Zoom to talk about um, what effect co uh, COVID has had on Shamanad. Hi, Helen. Nice to see you. Good morning, Jay. It's lovely to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Yes. Well, we were, we're checking in uh, to see how things are going up the hill, so to speak. And um, <clears throat> I wonder if you can give us a broad brush about how, how COVID has affected life at Shamanad, because we're all affected and, and I'm sure that to some significant degree, so is Shamanad. Well, you know, of course, I mean, we, we've, we've um, entered into this sort of new, very different world, right? All of us over the last few months. I think, um, I think the tone here has been to um, look as, uh, as much as we can at getting in front of this and, um, not being caught on the back foot, right? And and so, you know, our president, Dr. Lynn Babington, who sends her best wishes, by the way, she's- uh, And um, mine to her. Said right from the start of this, you know, we can come out of this stronger together, um, but we really have to pay attention to how this is affecting our students, how this is uh, affecting, you know, the anxiety levels among our faculty, um, you know, all of those kind of social emotional things that are happening in addition to the kind of collective anxiety about operations and um, the public health issues and the future of the state. And so I think it's been, um, it's been a time for us. It's been a challenge to our operations, no question, but not so much a challenge to the sort of the value system that we work in. And I think some of those strengths um, around everyone's sense of mission, everyone's sense of how do we continue to put the students first and central in all of our responses. I think that has enabled us to approach this, um, you know, what can you say, as well as can be expected, but with this sort of atmosphere of a kind of prayerful optimism and, and trying to keep the students at the center of everything that we do and all the decisions we make. You know, uh, you know, we've talked to uh, UH about this same issue about the effect of COVID, and we've talked to HPU about it. Um, talking to you, but you know what? One one thing that occurs to me from from uh, talking with you, Helen, is that um, Shamanad is different from those guys. Shamanad has a special sauce, a special focus, a special, as you say, a sense of mission, and it makes mm -hmm. uh, Shamanad different. And and maybe gives Shamanad a huge advantage here in dealing with a crisis where people can come together. It's it's a natural thing for Shamanad. Am I right? Do you see it the same way? I mean, I mean, the sense of community is obviously in everything that we do. And I think that during this period, that's that's had two uh, main effects. One is that we have sort of doubled down on that and responded to things as a community, uh, made sure that we're still behaving as a community, even if we have to use technology to do that, making sure that we're not just um, letting our students go off onto the Internet and log on to a remote class you know, a central challenge has been how do we maintain that shamanade education, that high touch education um, through a distance education format. Um, but also, I think it's affected us all because we feel the pain of the community we serve, right? Sure, you know, sure. Shamanade is so connected to those in our community who are marginalized through the work that we do in our social justice mission. And of course, you know, the whole sectors of our community, Jay, are just crying out, you know, around their economic distress, the anxiety and the mental health issues, the issues around what is the future? What is the future for a young person who is going to go to college um, this year? What does that look like? And so I think, you know, that closeness to community um, is one of our greatest strengths, but it's also been something that has, um, you know, it really made us aware of, of what our what our partners and our stakeholders and our students are going through. And just to give you an example, I mean, one of the, um, when we moved to, we pivoted to distance education, you know, in, in during the last semester. And for many of our faculty, that was a big adjustment. For many of them, they were already using um, online modalities to enrich their classes, you know, so it wasn't such a big adjustment. But one of the things that I was just so um, impressed by it's not just the way that they innovated pedagogically and they figured out how do we use simulation to teach nursing classes? How do we develop lab classes that can be delivered online? There was all of that creativity 
and I expect nothing less from our faculty. But what I felt they really, where they really came through for the students was to put their own sort of um, privilege aside and understand what this experience was like for a student who is trying to learn in a home where there might be a patchy internet connection, where there might be three or four other siblings being homeschooled, where devices might need to be shared, where people might be, be called in to work their other jobs as essential workers. And, um, you know, I've been on, you know, I think we've all been on a lot of webinars, right, since this, this thing started. And I've heard comments from colleagues on the mainland about, you know, how terrible it is that the students aren't showing up or, or whatever. And, and I just think that our faculty really have thought about what is it like on the other side of this Zoom interface for those students. And they've moved to adapt and change and refine their expectations and to support the students um, in that really kind of one-on-one -on -one way. And, and that I think is one of the big points of pride that I see in the way that we pivoted to the distance education. I, yeah. I give our faculty every credit for, for being responsive in that way and not just sending it out into the ether and hoping that the students learn, right? Yeah, so, yeah. So it's, con it's continuing high touch. There's a lot to be said for that. Right. And, uh, because and you can do it right and maybe not so right. And it sounds like uh, if you continue the high touch uh, approach to it, you're going to do better and they're going to do better. Yeah, we wanted, um, you know, to coin a not very popular phrase, but we wanted no students left behind, right? No one should be falling through the gaps because of this move to online. Mm -hmm. And if that meant that we had to get out there with technology or understand how to um, work with student schedules, you know, we're small enough that we could be responsive in that way. And I think, um, so we are returning, um, as is UH, as is HPU, we're returning to on-ground uh, on in-person classes for the fall. But of course, we and everyone have to be prepared to, to pivot back to distance education if there's ever a need to do so. And I think a lot of what we learned this semester is going to inform that um, the strategy that we have around if we do need to pivot in the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, one of the things that our provost, Dr. Lance Askelson, who is an expert actually in online and distance education, so every faculty member we have is being certified in online education over the summer because it is different. It is a different pedagogy. Um, and I just, I myself just went through the first uh, set of workshops and they're rigorous and they're really interesting. Um, and one of the, the elements of that whole training that the faculty are going through, you know, to be prepared to pivot if we need to in the future is how to build community in an online class. And so I just signed up for that workshop. And, and when I saw it, I thought, yeah, that's so Chaminade, right? That's, that's what we want to be able to do is maintain that high touch environment. Um, however, we're delivering the education. So. That being but, said, so, so it's more than just, are you using Zoom, by the way, or a program like Zoom? Yeah, it's Zoom, yeah. Zoom. So it's not, it's not just using Zoom. It's not just knowing every button on Zoom or, you know, all the backend settings and uh, all that. It's, um, it's also an attitudinal thing about yeah. how you create a classroom environment using Zoom. Yeah. And, I, and I wonder what the workshops are like on that point. For example, um, you have these breakout rooms. I don't know if your classes are big enough to warrant breakout rooms, but maybe you're using that. And, and of course, the way you recognize a student, the way you have a student present, answer questions and the like, the way you have the faculty engage, you know, in a kind of uh, Socratic, um, you know, communication with, with the students, uh, that's got to be all involved in the, in the, in the new world of mm -hmm. online education, uh, such as at your workshop. Am I right? Yeah. And what I'm, what I'm seeing is that, the, it's Zoom is the interface and then sort of backing that up we have the whole Google Classroom model, we have um, our learning management system Canvas which is very, it's a very sophisticated and I think a very um, student friendly LMS as they go and so you know you're seeing um, a lot of emphasis in the training, at least from what I can see, first of all on making sure that there is um, real connection between the faculty and the student. You know, so, you know, recording those videos, helping the students um, uh, participate in discussion groups in a meaningful way. And then, as you said, all of the kind of one-on-one -on -one, um, help 
and you know just in time kind of stuff that you need to do in a classroom that can be done in the breakout rooms and it can be done privately um, the group work I think is something that I've I was surprised in my class last semester after we moved it on online just how well the group participation worked and I felt in my limited just one class experience that our students were they seemed more willing to engage in the discussions and ask one another questions through the Zoom media than sometimes in class, you know, you can kind of just get that sort of silent treatment, right? Is, but, isn't uh, that true? Isn't that yeah, true? There's something about the electronic communication yeah. that opens you up, that makes you less reserved. I mean, yeah. take a, a student who might be a, a wallflower now, he's going to come out. It's the yeah. same thing that we, it's the same experience we have actually um, on, on think tech, uh, you know, with, with remote connection anywhere in the world, we find that people are so happy to talk to us one-on-one. -on -one. But I was, gonna, I was gonna ask you in that connection, um, you know, on Zoom, it's so good and you are refining it. I mean, I'm sure you're refining it more than just the workshop, it's every day in the experience of it, both faculty and student, um, that maybe in September, when let's assume that we're, we're all free to go back to school, I mean, physically, um, you might still use some of the lessons you've learned now on Zoom and maybe some courses, am I right, will continue to be remote? So actually our plan is that every course will be an in-person course for the fall. Um, you know, that that is the heart and soul of the Chaminade model. It's It's why students, come up to this, you know, the beautiful campus and have those close interactions with faculty. Now, I think for a number of years now, we've seen faculty, you know, flipping, hybridizing classes where they're using online as, as an aid to the teaching. And, and so I think we're gonna see that continue. And I think that we may actually see that develop further, but I'm not sure that we will see unless we, unless it's sort of, you know, an imposed need to pivot to online. I'm not sure that we're going to see kind of a wholesale adoption of that, you know, by our faculty, just because we, you know, we really feel that that on-campus experience is, is part of, of who we are and what we're trying to do for our students. You know, um, one thing that you're doing with Zoom, which I caught as you described it, is you're recording the sessions, the classes with Zoom. Mm -hmm. And indeed, you know, we have meetings among our hosts uh, on Zoom and we record it because not all hosts can be there. And we want the hosts who weren't there to take a look later. And so there's a tremendous advantage of that. I mean, I, you know, I'm one of those uh, people that uh, I miss a certain amount of what's said and I need to go back and listen to it again and possibly a, a third time. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a part of education. Remember the Latin, yeah? Repetitio mater studiorum. Uh, so repetition is the mother of study. <laughs> yeah. So, well, so I, how, do you, how do you achieve that if you're not doing Zoom in the fall? Yeah, I mean, the reinforcement is, is obviously, of, of learning is one of the key things that we can bring out of, of this that will, you know, strengthen us going forward. And I think there's been a couple of places, you know, you hit on a really good point, that the recording of the lectures, which a lot of students do anyway, actually in the in-person classes, it does give that ability to go back and check and it helps students. So if you look at a nursing curriculum, it's absolutely critical to be in contact with patients during your clinicals. And when, so then, you know, what do you do when that option is, is suddenly removed? And of course we were blessed a few years ago with the ability in our nursing program to set up a really sophisticated simulation center. And so we've been using that obviously, and that's been a, a great asset. Doesn't replace the patient experience, but what the literature says and what we're seeing is that it can really, really increase the student's confidence when they do eventually get into that patient setting because they can have a do-over. I mean, that's, that's the beauty, beauty of simulation is it is a safe space in which to experiment and test variables and get that kind of, not just the reinforcement of learning, but the ability to fail safely, right, and, and move forward. And so I think we're seeing that in the nursing simulation labs. I think we're seeing it uh, when we're running simulated labs um, for the science degrees. I think that that ability to iterate, refine, it's, it's the scientific method in action, but of course in a, in a normal three hour 
in-person lab, you might not really get that, that opportunity. And so we're seeing that be a really interesting um, outcome and, and, and strength of this approach that we're probably going to carry forward. That being said, we have other science faculty who are wearing um, GoPros on their heads and recording their labs as they do them and letting the students see um, a, a demonstration, but from that, imagine that kind of first person point of view. Sure. And why I watched a couple of those that our faculty have done. And of course, you know, if you've been working in a lab for 20 years, there's a lot of your technique as an experimentalist that is sort of, you might not necessarily um, speak about when you're doing a normal lab demonstration and the student wouldn't have the point of view to see it. And I've just been so impressed by how the students are actually getting to see um, how like an old, old lab hand like me, how do you really move your hands around in an experiment? And what are the sort of nuances of how you organize the space to do something carefully and reproducibly? And so, so again, there, there are these, um, there's these nuances that are coming out through these yeah. new ways of looking. Well, that's at, great, that's great. Well, well you, know, by, you know, at the bottom, at the end of the day, Helen, you are a scientist and there's plenty of science in Chaminade Mm -hmm. And I really appreciate that point. Probably didn't exist before. You, it's like uh, you're watching with the GoPro yeah. and you're seeing it through, through the laboratory researchers' uh, eyes. Yeah. And you're learning more than you would have learned if you were a third person watching from the other side of the room the, in a crowd of uh, students watching it. So mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a great advance. And in fact, it strikes me that you could do that even if you had classes in the laboratory. You could well, have the I same kind of, yeah. I think the faculty will. I think the things that they view that's made them stronger through this process, I think they'll carry forward. And I think, again, that um, that deepened understanding of what the circumstances of the students are, you know, through sort of seeing, I don't mean to, to make this sound sort of odd, but, but through seeing into their homes through the Zoom and, and understanding where the students are at, um, and the pressures that they have and the competing priorities. It's not, it's not like we didn't know this. You know, many of our students are low income, they're non-traditional students. We know this, but I think it's been brought home to us through this, this experience in a way that perhaps um, it hadn't before. Right, and right. That's a, again, makes that's a, the COVID experience is to see things, um, both strengths and weaknesses that you just weren't looking for before. So in this case, you haven't had to give up laboratory courses in, in the spring semester. Oh, no, not You've been at able all. to continue no. right along with it, eh? Yeah, everything's been running. Um, the faculty, you know, made a very rapid adaptation. And I would say that's the only thing that um, will be better in the fall, I think, is that we've had more time to plan out what we're yeah. doing. Yeah. Obviously, during, you know, the spring semester, it was a very reactive, very fast-moving situation. What about um, the students who don't, who, uh, I, I don't recall whether you have uh, dormitories or arrangements for students from uh, neighbor islands or, uh, or from out of state. Uh, how does that work? Are they still here? Is anybody studying from the mainland or from Asia or from the Pacific Islands? Uh, how are you communicating? How are you in, including them in the, in the program? Yeah, well, our, uh, our Vice President for um, Student Affairs, Dean Allison Jerome, she has done an amazing job of making sure that all of our students, um, when they when they were still in the dorms, so obviously it moved very quickly across the semester. Um, before um, the students started to leave the dorms to go back to their homes, um, we made sure that the dorms were, you know, safe places to be in terms of social distancing. Um, we were we supplied the students with uh, meals. Everything was sort of um, focused on on keeping them safe and 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 well fed. Uh, in the dorms. And then um, what emerged, I think, a little later in the semester was the fact that, of course, we have some students from the Pacific Islands who actually couldn't go home. So we kept the dorms open and again provided the food services. And for the students who um, left the dorms and returned to their family homes, either here or on the mainland, um, you know, they, we, we went through the whole process of making sure that it didn't hit them financially. Um, and so so I think that we have now just a very small number of students in the dorms over the summer who are from the Pacific Islands. And then as that situation changes, our dorms are gonna be open in the fall. And so there's a lot going on on campus right now with, um, 
you know, marking up the classrooms for social distancing, figuring out how we're going to manage the, um, you know, having rosters for the kitchens in the dorms. I mean, all of these things that we've just not had to think about before, but now we're trying to make sure we use the summer really well to get us prepared. Yeah. What makes it even more challenging is, um, I was going to mention this earlier in the context of how do you, how do you plan for the semester in the fall? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and nobody knows for sure what's going to happen between then and now. You know, we have surprise events every hour <clears throat> and every day. Uh, and certainly, how could you even predict uh, the, all the surprise events we'll have between now and the month of, we're still in May, uh, and uh, October, uh, uh, rather August or September. Um, so it's, it's a moving target, isn't it? And you have to have strategies and then strategies upon the strategies, plan A, plan B, plan C. Um, I'm sure you and Lynn Babington are working all day and all night on tr trying to figure out those scenarios, no? Yeah, and, and I, so it, the team, um, so Dr. Babington, obviously, and then um, our provost, um, Dr. Askelson, they've just done an amazing job. And I think probably there are binders in Lance's office that say plan A, plan B, plan C on the spines. But yeah, so, so what was um, done early on, maybe even a month or so ago, was um, sort of the laying out of, well, what are all the possible scenarios? I mean, we can't plan for everything, but there are some, you know, more and less likely scenarios. And a lot of that was based around, at that time, of course, we did not know whether Hawaii was going to be able to flatten its curve. Um, and so, so yes, so there, there is a plan in existence for, I would say, three or four major scenarios that could happen. But the, the way that we are thinking about it currently, as is HPU, as is UH Manoa, and the other UH campuses that will be in person with the ability to pivot, you know, yes. in a microsecond if we need to. Yes, right. Um, that's how you have to do it. It's a business that, matter. That's what we're, we're thinking right now. And, um, and then the other group that, you know, I just want to give a shout out to that's been really involved in all this is our campus ministry and our Marianist community here. Because, you know, one of the central Marianist um, educational values is adaptation and change, right? And so I think what they've helped us do is um, they've been, you know, touchstones in how do we do this in a, in a mission driven way, not just in a reactive way, um, but also seeing it as, as part of what um, Father Chaminade hoped his educational institutions would be, right? It's places where when the world throws you a curveball, you have the resilience to, and the creativity to sort of not just think your way through it, but but to respond to it in a way that keeps, yeah. keeps you to who you are. What a tremendous education it is for these kids to see it all unfolding and to learn the meaning of nimble. What about all the other events and programs? And, um, you know, you have a lot of things going on. And, and what, what have you had to give up here in the spring? And, and how will you resume them in the fall? Yeah. So I think um, one of the things obviously that's up in the air is, is it's not exactly clear what the situation will be for our athletes, at least for off-island travel. And, um, you know, our, we, our athletics um, uh, scholars are um, obviously really motivated. They have a lot of heart. And so we're, we're hopeful that, that they will see some return to um, being able to, to, to live out that identity as both an athlete and a, and a student. Um, I think that some of our summer programs that we were hoping to have in person, um, we've moved those online. And so um, I think a little while ago, I talked to you about our, we have a National Science Foundation grant that funds our Summer Data Science Institute. Um, and that's called SPICE, uh, which stands for Supporting Pacific Indigenous Computational Excellence. Uh, so, the magic of acronyms, that's yeah, a beauty. <laughs> what we did last year was we brought 22 students on campus and they did this one month data science immersion and it was amazing, you know. And so we, we had a little bit of a, I was worried for a while, you know, how are we going to do this? And then um, with our colleagues in Texas at the Texas Advanced Computing Center, um, we decided we're just going to go for it. And so that started uh, a week ago. We have 22 students. It's all being done online with some really innovative um, sort of virtual classroom environments. Um, but the really cool thing is, of course, um, a bunch of those students want to work the COVID data sets, right? So the whole principle oh. <laughs> um, is computing for change. It's basically that the students are asked 
to find um, a societal problem and address it through data analytics and data visualization and then present the outcomes. And um, so this year we formed them into teams. One team is looking at COVID and working with um, some of the leading modelers of the COVID outbreak. Um, one team is looking at environment. One team is looking at economic diversification and how we think about Hawaii's economy going forward. And then we have another team that's actually being partly led by one of our alums, who's a public health graduate, um, looking at um, healthcare and how things like healthcare economics, access to care, pre-existing conditions, um, health disparities, how they, how we need to be thinking about those and what the data show we need to, to address. Um, totally, totally relevant in our time, totally. You yeah, know, you know, these kids will be well prepared to deal with a with a, with a moving target. What, yeah. what about the uh, Hogan Entrepreneurial Program? Uh, yeah. We were talking before the show, and I guess there were changes there. How how has that fared in the context of COVID? So, so I think um, the uh, the actual Hogan Program itself continued in the online realm uh, over the course of the semester, and ending in this wonderful um, recognition event that we had that kind of had two purposes. One was to honor all the students who'd been through that program and provide them with their um, certificates. And it, again, it was all done virtually. Um, but the other thing, of course, was to honor John Webster, who retired. And he's headed that program for so many years and he's made it into a real launch pad for students into um, amazing careers and building professional networks here in Hawaii and, and so on. And so um, it was kind of bittersweet because John has retired and now um, Dr. Roy Panzarella has taken over the program. Um, he's gonna take it to the next level, no question about that. I do think that there will be um, going forward uh, an increased emphasis in that program about you know, the new economy, how we develop economy in Hawaii. And um, the students have always benefited from, benefited from the, first, the first hand experience of their mentors, the, the network of Hogan advisors. And I, I think it will be um, wonderful in the fall when we start to have those advisors in and coming in and telling the story of what their businesses have been through in this time. Very, very valuable program. I've attended your, your annuals uh, at the, at the Mystic, uh, Mystic Rose, is it? Yes. And yeah. uh, very impressive, very impressive students. Uh, but all, beyond that, a very impressive um, atmosphere of entrepreneurship. And uh, that's the kind of thing we need to do to move on to a more uh, diversified economy. Can yeah. you talk about that for a moment? Uh, because right now, you know, we're talking about how COVID has revealed the strengths and weaknesses of, uh, of, of Hawaii society and institutions. And certainly it makes it clear that we have to, we have to enhance uh, our contribution to entrepreneurship. Right, right. And, and entrepreneurship writ large, I mean, we have, um, for example, one of the students that I mentor, who's an alum of our Ho'ulu program, she is a nurse, um, registered nurse. She back graduated from our Bachelor's of Science in Nursing program, but she is a healthcare and social entrepreneur. That's the way that she's living out her nursing vocation. And so we are very interested in thinking not just about um, business development and innovation in, the, in that sector, but also in the social sector. I mean, there are a lot of jobs and there's a lot of vulnerability in the nonprofit sector in Hawaii. And I think that's something that we, we really want to think about how we can support that. So Shamanad, you know, we've been thinking a lot about how we can, you know, demonstrate that commitment to be re really being part of the recovery. And I think it sort of comes into sort of three main areas that, that we can um, make a contribution. You know, the one is, I mean, it sounds kind of a cliche, but, but education, to achieve economic mobility. I mean, so Chaminade, um, because of the students that we serve who are typically often low income, first generation, as you know, um, we score very highly, if not one of the top universities in the country in indices of economic mobility, of really that kind of generational change in a family that moves um, a whole family and community into a different um, echelon ec economically. Mm. And so we've been in, in Yiddish that that uh, the word for that is mitzvah. It's yeah. a good deed. Right, right. And so so we've been thinking a lot about that. And, and the, the pieces of that are that 
we need to make sure that we, despite the economic distress that, that's being felt across our whole you know, community, how do we make sure that we continue to lower those financial barriers so that those students can get this type of education and get that very, that very important for so, so that, many reasons. Yeah. That, that, that we're thinking about all the time. I think that there are direct actions that we can take in terms of workforce development. So we've been very focused, as you know, on the healthcare workforce, um, which is only going to, I think, uh, increase in, in terms of need um, as, we, as we move through this kind of COVID period. The other thing that we have done in that area is that we um, have started in the fall, probably the best timed opening of a program in the history of the universe, with, uh, university, which is that we are starting a community and public health degree in the fall. <laughs> and it's already on the books before all of this happened. I think they'll be lining up for that one. And, and you know, and they are, and, and it's very exciting. Um, and that was actually, that was a decision we took, um, you know, over a year ago now to broaden our um, healthcare portfolio into the community, rural health, and mm -hmm. build off of what we've done in nursing, which is amazing. Um, but, but really think about, you know, community care, rural care, um, health education, health promotion, and public health. And we were inspired, um, a couple of our alums um, who actually came to Chaminade thinking about pre-medical programs, but ended off going into public health, really inspired us um, that this is something that, this, that the um, students we really want to be able to think about a career in healthcare, you know, either at the bedside or in a kind of public health epidemiology setting. And so, um, one of our alums, Matal Fayai, she is um, a biology graduate who went to George Washington University to do um, a master's in public health. She's now working American Samoa as an epidemiologist, and she just got admitted to the Yale School of Public Health. Oh, that's fabulous. That's, 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 and that's, that's, she and I have been in contact, and she's been saying for years, you know, we, we need to do something in public health. We need to do something in public health. And... Um, Another one of our, our alums who's a, a Micronesian student, Johnny Aldan from Saipan, um, he just graduated with his master's in public health from Eastern Washington University. And what he did was um, his thesis was actually looking at what he thought was an important data set for looking at pre-existing conditions, um, looking at metabolic syndrome diabetes. But of course, uh, and he looked at it in a um, geospatial way. So looking at how it, um, distributes geographically by neighborhood in Saipan. And of course, that's exactly the information you need if you're deciding where you need to do lockdowns for pre-existing conditions. Yeah, we're COVID. living in a world of change. But so, before, so before we, we run out of time, Helen, I want to oh, ask sorry. you about the, the financial aspect to this. Mm -hmm. have, you, have you had to cut faculty? Um, you know, uh, have you had to change tuition? Have you lost students in the process? Because um, these things do happen. And, uh, you know, how, how are your funding sources doing in the time of COVID? Uh, you know, uh, educational institutions like other nonprofits, they all have their issues. How have, how have you fared in, uh, you know, in this difficult period? So, so, so not to say that we are not worried, obviously, and, and taking it very seriously, but um, Dr. Babington did make a commitment early on in this that we would not uh, furlough or lay off our workers who could not work from home because she felt that that would you know strike the most vulnerable people on our campus and she just was not willing to do that so at this stage we have not had to make those cuts we've not had to furlough we've not had to lay anybody off um, and our admissions and enrollment are working you know double triple time um, but I think that there's a lot of um, cautious optimism there because what we, I think, are known for here is a really excellent private education right here at home in Hawaii. And I think there may be a lot of families who are, are thinking about that right now and considering, you know, the, the decision to go to the mainland. Um, so we are just working really hard to bring our class in and um, welcome, welcome a good class in the fall and, do the, and, and just really deliver them a great Chaminade education. In terms of our funding sources, I mean, as you know, we have a lot of um, grants from the National Science Foundation, National Institutes of Health. Um, our Title III funding has held steady. 
we um, were able to receive um, CARES Act funding. And so that's been um, holding really well. Um, our National Science Foundation has showed um, great flexibility and great co uh, cooperation, um, which are, you wouldn't necessarily expect from a large federal agency. So they've been really helping us. And we have just been pumping out new grant proposals to sort of um, support our students. Um, we just put in another $1 million NSF scholarship grant in addition to the one that we already have. So we're really thinking um, that there are a lot of opportunities out there in terms of funding. And, and so we want to make sure that we're well positioned to, to, ex to explore those. Um, and again, really focus on how do we, um, where we can, drive that funding towards supporting students so that they can get a Shamanad education. Last question, Helen, and forgive me, it's a little personal, but uh, have you uh, been affected by COVID? So um, very sadly, uh, I'd lost my mum. Uh, she uh, was 91 and she was in a care home in England and she passed away. Um, which has been an incredibly difficult thing to process from so far away. Um, my, because of the situation in the care homes, it was locked down. So it was that situation that so many families have been in where they were not able to uh, be with their loved ones at the end. And the funerals were very, um, very sparse. And so that's, that's been, um, incredibly difficult thing to to deal with from a distance um, but um, our community here on campus has been incredibly supportive and loving and um, you know oh, they nice. do some things That's to honor my mother so there was a mass here for her and uh, yeah. so, so yeah. sorry so sorry about the loss Helen and okay. sorry that it had to be the way it was you know that uh, we live in a new time now um, and, I hope and, we can and, check back it, with you one thing in, in Hawaii, we, we have we have flattened the curve, you know, and but in a lot of places in the world, that's not the case. And I think it's really um, important for us to understand here what other places in the world are going through. It, it has been incredible, um, I think, in places like England, New York and so on. Yes, we, the world is the world has to think together now. Yeah. And so all the institutions of higher learning have to think together. Thank you so much, Helen Turner, for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate your sharing. And we are impressed, I think, with uh, everything that has happened uh, in Chaminade and that will happen. Uh, thank you so much for your efforts, not only for the school, but for the community. It's wonderful to talk to you. And um, hopefully we can touch base again in the fall. Absolutely. Helen Turner, aloha. Thank you so aloha. much.